there are not committed more than 15 minutes or an hour. And they drug that lamb by the neck. Come on, lamb. I've had you for three days, and I'm going to drag you to the priest because God has demanded that we do. And God said, sacrifice it, but it's not going to do you a bit of good. You might just get leprosy. In the New Testament, the outward sacrifice, Charles, would you just teach and stop preaching? I'm sorry. In the New Testament, you know, John wants me to preach occasionally, so I do that. In the New Testament, the outward sacrifice has ceased. And God calls only for the living sacrifice. And this is a call to dedication. First, there's a call to dedication. I don't know if I've got written down or not, but the call of dedication. It is a call to commitment. And this, beloved, is the logical, the only logical conclusion to all of this is redemption. The only way that you can give your life as a living sacrifice is redemption. There is no other logical conclusion. This is Romans 12.1. The only proper response to God excuse me, is the redeeming work. The only proper response. Now we are then to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. What does that mean? There are four elements of a living sacrifice. Let me give you one tonight. We don't want to just to talk about it in a red term. Just throwing it out rhetorically. But we want to express specifically what it contains. So let me discuss with you out of this text the four elements in a living sacrifice. The four elements. This is very foundational to our spiritual experience. The four elements that are included in the presentation of a believer as a living sacrifice are these. Here we are. Soul, body, mind, and the will. Four things. What did I just say? Is soul. What's next? Body. Body. What's next? Mind. Mind. Mind? Oh. Mind? 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 Soul, body, mind, and will. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. First of all, offering myself to God as a living sacrifice implies that my soul has been given to God. It implies that. It all starts at that point. I cannot offer anything else to God unless my soul has been given to Him. Right? Unless I have given Him my soul, I haven't, I, I haven't offered anything yet. My soul belongs to God because it is to my soul that the text appeals. It is a call to a regenerated soul to make a proper offering. And it is that soul, and if that soul is not regenerated soul, not a redeemed soul, not a saved soul, not a transformed soul, there is no way that the message of God can be communicated to that soul. And there is no way that it can respond. 
So the very fact that he says, I beg you therefore, brothers, you who have experienced the mercies of God, to present yourself a living sacrifice. It implies that they are believers whose souls have already been given to God in salvation. God never has asked a lost person to give him anything. God doesn't even listen to a lost person. If I regard iniquity in my heart, God doesn't listen. So, this is, not, this is not something that a person can do unless they have been redeemed. Nothing else can be offered to God if the soul hasn't been offered. An unregenerated person cannot give God his body for service cannot give God his mind, cannot give God his will, cannot respond to God at all if he hasn't first given his soul. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says that the natural man cannot even understand the things of God. They utterly are foolishness. There's no way that Scripture could ever appeal or the Holy Spirit would ever appeal to an unregenerated person to make a supreme act of dedication to God. Lost people who hear the gospel priest and hear a preacher priest give your life to Christ is utterly stupid, foolish to me. To ask a lost person to serve God is foolish. And the truth is repeated in Scripture. Uh, Richard, uh, Matthew 16, 26. Build, uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 3 to 5. Let's read a couple of verses and let's see what is obvious. Matthew 16, 26. 16.26 is that in your notes? Mm -hmm. yeah. For what is man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So the soul is are you going to exchange it for the world or are you going to exchange it for God? Now scripture refers to the soul as that inner part of man which God seeks to redeem. Sometimes scripture calls it the spirit of a man. The spirit or the soul is the inner part, the invisible part, that is the very basic man himself. The essence of being. And that must be given to God. I can out outwardly perform like I'm okay. I can outwardly perform and fake you out that I love God or that I love my wife, or that I love you. I can outwardly do things that my soul is totally against, and I'm angry that I even want to act that way. 2 Corinthians 8, 3-5, I believe. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much Entreaty, entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministry of the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. And they first were willing to give of themselves. Amen. In other words, they dug into the very lifeblood. <coughs> they dug into their food money, their survival money to give. And why is it that they would do that? Why such dedication? Why such commitment? Why such living sacrifice? Verse 5 says, This they did not as we hoped, but first gave themselves to the Lord. And that's the key. That's always the key before, my, before any single 
act of sacrifice can be done, there must be the giving of self. It has to be there to start. Romans 8.8 8 says this, So then, they that are in the flesh, listen to this, Romans 8.8, 8, So then they that are in the flesh, unregenerated, not saved, cannot, Romans 8.8, 8, cannot what? Please God. Please God. And to be in the flesh means to be unregenerated. An unredeemed person cannot please God, cannot make an offering to God, cannot worship God, cannot present anything to God. You hear an unregenerated, you hear an unregenerated person say, "Well, I do what I do for God." Now that's not so. God doesn't accept anything. From a lost person. I don't know how, why in the world that you would go out and ask a lost person to give money to the church. Nobody. People do it all the time. There is no sacrifice made of body, mind, or will unless there is first the giving of the soul in redemption. And that's essentially what Paul is saying when he says in 1 Corinthians 13, 3, 1 Corinthians 13, 3, these very important words. Who has that? Can I give that to somebody? Go ahead. 13, 3. I think and it's though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it forfeits me nothing. So what does that verse say? everything I've got if I do not have the love of Christ it's of no value I am not one <clears throat> if I am not one who possesses the love of God all my acts of self sacrifice are worthless Amen. so when a person comes to me and says I don't want to do this, but I will. Normally I say, don't do it. How often have I said to a person, I don't want to do this anymore. And I said, don't. They'd come to me and say, I, I'm, I'm tired of singing in a choir. And I would say, don't. Well, I'm very tired of, I'm very tired of teaching a class. Don't. I'm just tired of not even coming to your church. And I would say, you <laughs> you you person you I'm curious as I'll get over it the one thing I can't get over is people quitting the church I take that personally I really do it's all charity's fault <laughs> it doesn't mean a thing to them he may give to charity. He may give himself to philanthropy. He may sell everything he has and dispense it to the poor people and think in his heart he's made an offering to God when in fact of the matter is that is not the case at all. Somebody might say, I, I love my mom. I love, I love mom. But if they do not act like it, they don't. Someone said this week, I just love you, I just love you. And the other person says, if you love me, you've been acting like it the last three or four years. You don't love me. You just say that. It's coming from your lips, but not from your heart. Now, all of this is implied, if you notice in Romans 12, in Paul's opening statement, it is all implied when he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. It is because they are brethren, a term of identification of those who know the Lord, 
It is because they are brothers in Christ. It is because they have received the mercies of God that they can be begged to follow after the praise of dedication. In other words, this is what Paul says. You are believers. He's talking to people that are saved. And then he says, you have received the mercies of God. And as a result of that, I'm going to beg you to give your life to Christ. And it is because of that. And I think you can sense that in the text, if the soul has not already been given to the Lord, then the rest of the exhortations are useless because it is the soul that responds to the beseeching and urging. I urge you to give yourself to the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ.